On January 15th, 2021, the online streaming service Disney Plus premiered its first official MCU television series, tying into the films directly for the first time. This series was the highly anticipated WandaVision, following Wanda Maximoff and The Vision as they navigated a surreal and strange new life as sitcom characters. Before getting into things, I would recommend watching my previous video on The Scarlet Witch, where I discussed Wanda's history and character development up until WandaVision's premiere. I uploaded it right before WandaVision aired and it lays the groundwork on what brought Wanda to her situation in WandaVision. Well, at least what we knew until then. Getting my thoughts together after watching WandaVision, I realised that this was probably going to be too much for one video. Uh, later in the writing process, it then turned out to be too much for two videos. Thanks for pointing that out, Kelda. Therefore, this one division analysis will be split into three videos. This video will focus on the general one division premise, world building, and characters. The MCU and the importance of world building. World building is the process of constructing a fictional world or universe in which a story is set. It is most commonly used in sci fi and fantasy writing. Good world building is when a believable, well-rounded setting is created for characters to inhabit and play out their story, in a way that feels natural and understandable for the audience. The writers will usually present new rules and ways of living that normal audiences would be unfamiliar with, but their characters will understand and react to. Depending on how long a story is, the world building for a setting could be quite concise and limited. But as a story expands and there are follow-ups, it is vital for the world building to remain consistent or to develop naturally. Sequels and prequels aren't new to cinema, expanding on the original story to provide more context or just to meet up with the characters in a new situation. However, what Marvel Studios did differently was create a series of films, such as the Iron Man series, and then make references to other films that were created by Marvel around the same time. These characters, usually coming from their own Marvel film series, would eventually cross over into a new flagship film series, such as The Avengers. These films were not just sequels, but crossover films that reference each other, creating what Marvel called a cinematic universe. This cinematic universe continued to grow, with new heroes introduced both on and off Earth, further expanding a literal universe of possibilities and characters. Prior to Iron Man in 2008, the Marvel in-universe was quite similar to our reality, but as more heroes emerged publicly... Truth is... I am Iron Man. ...and dangerous battles took place across many different locations, this world had to grow with the characters. There are repercussions now for actions, such as the Avengers' many battles introducing the Accords, that would impact how the government viewed and controlled newer heroes in future films and television shows. In the lead-up to the release of Infinity War in 2018, there was a lot of excitement to see different characters from the MCU finally meet each other. Infinity War was frequently referred to as the biggest crossover event in cinematic history by fans. The cast list was huge, the expectations were high, and the box office ended up being nearly record-breaking. Prior to Infinity War, 18 MCU films had been released, and they all led up to this. There were a lot of conversations on what films to watch for Infinity War, as there were already so many, and which films were most important to watch in order to understand the context of each in-joke, reference, and storyline. Marvel was already combining the idea of television and cinema, as the films became more like episodes of an enormous story. Every film has been carefully overseen by Marvel Studios president Kevin Feige, to ensure continuity for the characters and situations, and believable world building that would lead the way for more characters and stories in the future. It's no wonder the MCU has managed to gather such a dedicated fan base, when a lot of care was taken by Feige in translating immensely popular comic books into live action films. This sort of world building is not easy, which is why Feige should be given plenty of credit for his work. As a world is expanded like this, it gets easier for the audience to find plot holes or for the audience to question why a certain character wasn't present for a big moment. That is why Feige makes no secret that he has films planned out years in advance 
in order to ensure the best care is taken in setting up new plot threads and ensure the MCU is moving in a direction that will fit the future goals of Marvel Studios. Feige has spoken about the pressure to please fans. If we thought too much about pleasing everybody about everything, <clears throat> We would collapse into a fetal position and never do anything. Um, so we don't do that. We think mainly about what we think would be interesting, what we think would be cool, what we think would fulfill a promise we uh, set up, what we think would um, grow the MCU in an unexpected way uh, that people uh, aren't anticipating, um, killing half of your heroes, for instance. Um, uh, and that's, but but it, it, it is true that we always make the films with the intention of them working for people who've watched every other film we've made, and for people who've never seen one of our movies. And yes, with Infinity War and Endgame, it gets tougher at that point, but, but uh, we test screen all of our movies, like additional photography, test screening. I don't know why, never become too arrogant that you think you don't have something to learn from an audience, uh, would be one piece of advice I would give you. He understands that there is a huge expectation that comes from the Marvel audience, who now look for small details and Easter eggs provide clues for the future direction of the stories, such as the Infinity Gauntlet being in Odin's vault in 2011, years before the Infinity Stones became a huge plot point. Odin's treasures. Fake. Most of the stuff in here is fake. While Marvel has created its own immensely popular cinematic universe that has dominated screens for the last 13 years, it was not the first to take these lengths to build a cohesive, huge world for its fans to explore. For example, Star Wars has made use of comic books, games, and television shows for years to expand on their world, which are confirmed canonical stories. Even back in the 1930s, Universal had its own monster series starring Frankenstein, Dracula, and more. Recently, they attempted to reboot this under the Dark Universe banner to, uh, not the best results. I saw her. She is real. Marvel has been able to base a lot of its work on a rich history of comic books spanning back decades. This abundance of materials means fans are able to follow along with stories or predict where characters and stories go next. It also allows the MCU filmmakers to slip in little comic book references that more dedicated fans would appreciate, whereas casual fans wouldn't notice, adding to the excitement of being a committed fan. Even a reference inside a reference, like this moment also being a nod to Captain America's controversial reveal in the comics as an agent of Hydra, while also calling back to a moment in the MCU's Winter Soldier film. Before we get started, does anyone want to get out? Yeah, we can't give you the subject. I'm gonna have to call the director. That's okay. Trust me. Hail Hydra. This makes little moments in the MCU all the more rewarding for dedicated fans, and is Marvel's way of showing appreciation and giving a little wink to the audience. This is where Feige must again be credited. He has long overseen the direction of the MCU and fought for inclusivity and new stories to expand the cinematic universe. Feige has been involved since the beginning, and continues to be involved in every aspect of the MCU, to ensure the continuity of the stories and characters remain consistent, and the world building brings positive and interesting changes to the very big Marvel Universe. That being said, with a new Marvel property coming out multiple times a year from 2021, the world of the MCU can become quite daunting for even committed viewers. I know people who've been a bit exhausted by the amount of required watching to see a new movie, especially a big one like in the main Avengers series. Being a Marvel fan requires commitment. Each new Marvel property is almost a sequel to the previous one, or a vague spin-off that will eventually come back into the main storyline of the MCU. 
It will be interesting to see if Marvel decides to take a more standalone approach for some of its properties in the future, with only vague links to main heroes, in order to entice newer fans who do not want to watch all the previous properties. Of course, this is subjective, but what makes the viewing commitment worth it is the care taken by the creators to tie everything in the MCU together and to keep taking risks. This can be seen in One Division, where the characters are placed in a mysterious, surreal sitcom environment that still expands on the wider world building and possibilities of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. It's still familiar, as it's the MCU, but it is something different and fresh in an entirely new format. One Division, a quick recap. One Division has nine episodes in total, so I won't go into detail in each episode, but I'll give you a brief recap for those feeling a little forgetful. So I remember everything. That's not an exaggeration. In fact, I'm incapable of exaggeration. Most of the One Division episodes center around a specific decade of sitcom television, starring two Avengers, Wanda and Vision, the latter of whom died at the end of Avengers Infinity War. There are two perspectives here, that of Wanda and Vision and Westview, acting out a different decade of television each day, with silly hijinks and stories to fill the gaps, and the sword agents outside Westview, also known as the Hex, who are trying to figure out what is going on inside and who is the cause of this. And the cause of this is Wanda, or more specifically, Wanda's grief. Following Vision's death and seeing him dismantled and experimented upon in the sword facility, Wanda's grief takes over and she unintentionally creates this happy, grief-free sitcom world, trapping all Westview residents within. When creating the Hex, she also creates a new vision and Lisa becomes pregnant with twin boys to complete her family. Wanda seems to have repressed these pre-Hex memories, or rather how exactly she accomplished this. Yet, throughout the series, she does exhibit control over this world and throws out and threatens anyone who tries to ruin her new idyllic life and family. The series ends with Agnes revealing her true self as Agatha Harkness, a fellow witch. Agatha has been watching Wanda, trying to figure out the root of her power and manipulating Wanda's carefully created environment to discover the truth behind her extraordinary powers. Wanda is confronted with what she has done and decides to undo the Hex, accepting her place as the prophesied Scarlet Witch, and mentally traps Agatha in her false sitcom role as punishment for trying to steal her power. Meanwhile, Sword has successfully created a new White Vision, who vacates the series to contemplate his existence after a confrontation with Wanda's Vision. The series ends with Wanda studying an ancient spellbook after leaving Westview. Outside the Hex Although the majority of the series takes place inside Wanda's false reality, The Hex, WandaVision expands on the Marvel world following the events of Avengers Endgame. This is similar to what Spider-Man Far From Home did. The opening of the Spider-Man sequel provided a little recap of the events that happened in the eight months since the snap, such as people being displaced without homes once they have snapped back, and returned children having to repeat the full school year again. Episode 4 of WandaVision begins with a close-up of the chaos of Snap people returning to their original places. Although it's not really made clear in Avengers Endgame, Kevin Feige answered in a Reddit Q&A that the Hulk would have ensured all people were returned safely, so there isn't anyone merging with furniture or falling from the sky. In Monica Rambeau's case, the audience watches as particles form her again, in a reverse fashion from how people vanished previously. She seems completely oblivious to having been gone at all. The hospital halls are packed as long-gone people are materialising, and everyone else is in the same state of confusion and panic as Monica. It's a raw, shocking scene, and is very sudden since it opens the episode, so the audience feels the same initial confusion and shock. There is further world-building connected to Monica Rambeau, as this is the first time S.W.O.R.D. plays a key role in the narrative. S.W.O.R.D. is S.H.I.E.L.D.'s outer space counterpart, and since S.H.I.E.L.D. was instrumental in setting up the original Avengers, introducing a space-based equivalent would hint S.W.O.R.D. will be just as significant to the MCU. Monica's mother, Maria, founded S.W.O.R.D. after her experiences in the Captain Marvel film, meaning it's already been active for almost 30 years, but most of the MCU stories so far have taken place on or around Earth. 
The scrolls that first appeared in Captain Marvel made an appearance in the finale to let Monica know that she is ready to go back up to the stars. Linking her story back to Spider-Man 2's post credit scene, where we see Nick Fury is already out in space, and cementing Monica's place in the wider Marvel Cinematic Universe. When making these links to other films and storylines, WandaVision is reaffirming to the audience it is still dedicated to creating a bigger world for the MCU, despite not being in the usual film format. This television series is very much a part of Phase 4, post Endgame, and provides setup for future Marvel properties. Another link WandaVision makes to the wider MCU is to Doctor Strange, but in an interesting and slightly more subtle way. WandaVision introduces chaos magic into the MCU. The audience has already encountered a different kind of magic with Doctor Strange, who is the Sorceress Supreme, but chaos magic, which Wanda controls and Agatha wants to control, seems to be something else entirely, and with a darker purpose. Agatha has an ancient spellbook called the Darkhold, which contains spells that use chaos magic, and foretells of the Scarlet Witch, who will bring destruction to the world. Wanda is studying this book in the final moments of the season, and hearing the echoes of her children that no longer exist, foretelling a lot of trouble is still on its way for this tragic and isolated character. Considering that Wanda's next scheduled appearance is in the Doctor Strange sequel, it's very likely that Wanda's newfound spellbook and her chaos magic will play a large role in that story. As expected we're building a large varied world of events and characters for the Marvel Universe, WandaVision introduces and reintroduces us to many characters, who were developed further with this television series. Characters are a key part of creating a fictional world, as their views, actions and interactions influence the world around them. Without the limited time of a feature film, WandaVision is able to put its characters in specific situations and spend more time with them on screen, making them more three-dimensional and human to the audience. The characters. There are a lot of characters in WandaVision, so I will try to keep this as concise as possible. Wanda Maximoff herself will be focused on more in the final WandaVision video, so you'll have to wait for her full character analysis then. Vision Paul Bettany really gets to show off his comedic talents, as he stars as Vision in different sitcom eras, even appearing drunk at one point. Bettany and Elizabeth Olsen are genuinely funny, and really sell the premise of the show, especially the sitcom bits. They also have fantastic and believable chemistry together. WandaVision is the first time Vision is fully explored. It's interesting though, because this is also a new Vision. There are now three Visions in the MCU. The original, Wanda's creation, and the recreated White Vision. Each Vision is different. The original is dead and likely gone for good. Wanda's version is slightly altered from the original, in that he's a bit more humorous to fit the sitcom moulds, maybe slightly idealised as memory of loved ones tend to be, and he doesn't have the memories pre Westview that would be a big part of Vision's character and development. I think, I, I, I think it, 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 works. It, 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 works. it works. The new White Vision is much more cold and robotic, having been created with the sole purpose of being a weapon. He then undergoes an identity crisis as he's flooded with memories of a love and life he never truly experienced, and bails. Even though the original Vision is dead in the current timeline, I really love the scene in episode 8 which took the time to build on his character and why Wanda connected with him in the first place. In this scene, the audience sees the original Vision comfort Wanda. This is very soon after he was born in Age of Ultron, so he's still a bit naive and awkward towards her, but he's also intelligent and trying to make sense of grief as he's never experienced anything like it before. Wanda's vision in the finale feels so genuinely like the original vision too. After engaging the white vision in physical combat, he then turns to intellect and a thought experiment to actually defeat his foe, knowing that is what he would react to best. Why are you doing this? My programming directive is to destroy the vision. But I'm not the true vision. Only a conditional vision. I request elaboration. As the series goes on, Wanda's vision becomes less complacent in Wanda's reality. He begins to notice the strange things no one else does and decides to investigate it. 
This makes him feel more like the real original Vision, even though he is Wanda's creation. His intelligence and heroic nature is not dulled by her. He is cautious and cunning when investigating, and his goal is to help the people of the town, although he is torn by his love for Wanda. Even when Vision is dying, his focus is telling Sword to help the people of Westview. He remains an Avenger at heart and a compassionate person, which is who Wanda fell in love with. It's a bit of a shame to lose this version of Vision so soon because he was a fantastic, sensitive character and it feels a little frustrating that this character exploration will have to start again with a new version of Vision. At the end of WandaVision, there is one Vision left. It's likely that this Vision will still be quite similar to the other versions as they are all echoes of the same character. It's also exciting to consider what Vision and Wanda will be like in their next appearance, as well as their potential interactions. Because when WandaVision ends, both Wanda and Vision are at a big turning point in their lives of figuring out who they are, separately. The audience doesn't really know White Vision and what his choices will be going forward. We can assume some of these choices because there must be a blending of characters somewhere, but it's difficult to know where they blend. White Vision was created by director Hayward as a weapon first and foremost, yet has received conflicting love-filled memories of compassion and heroism that he did not experience firsthand. Monica Rambeau Monica first appeared in the MCU in Captain Marvel as a young girl. Now she's all grown up and working for S.W.O.R.D. and seems to hold some resentment towards anybody else came close. Well, I'd argue that Captain Marvel came close. Her powers came from an Infinity Stone too, right? We are not talking about her, we are talking about Wanda. As mentioned earlier, her family's experience in Captain Marvel also directly led to the creation of S.W.O.R.D., demonstrating how influential her mother and Captain Marvel were in Earth's exploration and research of space and other life, even after Captain Marvel left Earth. Monica is also going through a very deep and new grief, similar to Wanda, when the series begins. Due to the snap, she has spent the same amount of time as Wanda grieving the loss of her mother, who died during the five-year gap. She understands the grief that Wanda is experiencing, and that is why she is so sympathetic to her throughout the series. You don't hate me. Given the chance and given your power, I'd bring my mom back. You know I would. After Wonder and Vision, Monica is a central character to the series. Her empathy for Wonder drives the Sword storyline forward, and she is a direct conflict to director Hayward and his desire to go in guns blazing to fight Wanda. She is still the determined and adventurous young woman audiences met in Captain Marvel, but now is more mature and able to act on her adventurous mindset. The series also shows Monica's transformation into the superhero spectrum through very appropriate visuals. Her transformation is caused by her persistent travels through Wanda's reality-altering hex defences, in the comics, Monica gains her powers from interacting with extra-dimensional energy, so the MCU does not go too far off from the comics here, replacing that energy with chaos magic. Disappointingly, once Monica gains her new super abilities, the WandaVision writers run out of ideas for what to do with her next. She tries to speak to Wanda again, but Agatha gets in the way. Twice. Wanda, you have to... I think you overstayed your welcome. Poor Wanda's been through enough. This doesn't concern you. Wanda, run along, dear. Snooper's gonna snoop. And then she shows up to fight alongside the twins, see Wanda out of Westview, and set up her next appearance in the Marvels. Despite a great build-up, Monica has no influence on the plot in the later episodes, which is very frustrating for the fans of her character, who expected more of a payoff when Monica managed to re-enter the Hex. Dr. Darcy Lewis and Agent Jimmy Woo 
Both Darcy and Jimmy have made appearances in previous films, returning to the MCU in one division as further developed characters. Darcy was last seen in Thor The Dark World in 2013 as Jane Foster's sassy assistant. I'm in the middle of something here. Um, I'm pretty sure we are getting arrested. Hold that thought. Look at you, so muscly and everything. How's space? What's great about this appearance is when Darcy was in the Thor series, she was studying political science. But after her time with Jane, Darcy now has a PhD in astrophysics. It's Lewis. Dr. Lewis. We have your gear. She has grown as a character too. She's still a little standoffish and facetious, but also more focused and mature. She's recruited by Sword for her talent and doesn't waste a second improving her worth, realizing Wanda is televising her reality. Agent Wu, meanwhile, debuted in Ant-Man and the Wasp in 2018, interacting with Scott Lang during his house arrest. There's a great moment with his WandaVision introduction where he does a quick blink and you miss it card trick with his hand that stems from him learning it after seeing Scott perform some. James E. Wu, FBI. These characters perform their own investigations with Monica when they see the corruption of Sword's current director and that his intentions aren't as straightforward as they may seem. Monica Darcy and Agent Wu counter Hayward's methodical and cold approach to the Hex. The three of them provide some comic relief and levity to the S.W.O.R.D.'s storyline and aim to help Wanda and the residents of Westview instead of condemning the troubled Avenger. Agnes slash Agatha Harkness. For a lot of theory frenzied fans, Agnes's reveal as Agatha was not surprising, but was very welcome. In the comics, Agatha acts as Wanda's mentor for the most part, aiding her in controlling and understanding her magic. The MCU puts their own spin on Agatha by making her the antagonist of the series. Sensing Wanda's magic, Agatha came to Westview to investigate and figure out how to take it for herself. Agatha's big reveal at the end of episode 7 also resulted in the best intro in the series, taking full advantage of the television format. Of course, Catherine Hahn is amazing as Agatha. She already has plenty of sitcom experience under her belt in guest roles such as in Brooklyn Nine-Nine and Parks and Rec. So it was fun to see her back in those types of roles, but also in sitcoms from different decades. Unfortunately, one of the problems with this series is the lack of a clear motivation for Agatha. While she tells the audience she really wants Wanda's power, she seems to flip back and forth between doing this to stop the Scarlet Witch prophecy of destroying the world and just for the sake of wanting power. Likewise, she switches back and forth from threatening Wanda and her family to trying to get on Wanda's sweet side by saying she will fix Wanda's spell and let her and her family live happily in Westview once Wanda surrenders. Despite Wanda clearly beginning to rot as she gives up her powers. This creates a confusing environment in which it seems clear for Wanda not to trust Agatha because of this back and forth, but also confuses Agatha's overall motivation and plan to succeed. Agatha's flashback in episode 8 keeps up this unclear facade as she seems to flick back and forth between wanting to be good and also wanting to be very powerful, and showing little to no remorse at killing her coven and mother. It isn't obvious why she wants to be so powerful, nor why she turned evil. In terms of expanding the possibilities for the MCU, Agatha's appearance in the series confirms the existence of chaos magic and demonstrates that there may be other witches out in the world, likely hidden and living in secrecy like Agatha. It's possible that in the future, Wanda may encounter more magic users, other than the sorcerers, who understand the ruins Agatha uses and form covens of their own. There seems to be a difference between Doctor Strange's group of sorcerers, also known as the Masters of the Mystic Arts, and the witches seen in Agatha's flashback, even simply from the way they perform magic. <laughs> Director Tyler Hayward. Director Hayward is introduced in the fourth episode of WandaVision, where he and Monica seem to be on good terms and he asks Monica to investigate Westview. The character of Hayward is used to explain Sword to the audience, 
and to later act as the secondary antagonist in the series when his intentions are shown to be more violent and selfish than previously thought. Unfortunately, like Agatha Harkness, Hayward's motivation for ignoring Vision's wishes to not be made into a weapon is not explored beyond seemingly wanting more military weapons. He seems to exist to be the stubborn military villain that always believes in violence over conversation. It's a tired, worn trope that doesn't have anything new happen here with his character, despite all of his screen time. It ultimately turns him into a very bland, one-dimensional side villain that doesn't do anything more than provide exposition and is a basic foe to defeat. Now that we have the lay of the land, let's talk about strategy. It is I, uh, the policy of the US government that never to me. negotiate with indeed. terrorists. Which is a characteristic of lazy writing and poor world building because the character relies too heavily on tropes and cliches. For example, to repeatedly emphasize to the audience that we're not meant to like him, his reactions go quite extreme pretty quickly. When he admonishes Monica for speaking out against him, he cruelly says that her mother would be disappointed in her, hurting her really deeply. Maybe it's a good thing you weren't here when your mother died. Because clearly you don't have the stomach for this job. Get her off my base. Now. Then in the finale, he shoots at Wanda's children with no remorse before fleeing the scene. He barely has a reaction to the fact he shoots Monica who survives, which feels like poor direction and writing since he has presumably known her for a long time prior to all of these events. Shooting at the children and Monica feels like an over-the-top moment to really hammer home to the audience that he is a bad guy. It also creates a contrast that I feel is very intentional, that Wanda isn't as much of a villain as Hayward, as he seems more at ease with his cruelty, whereas hers is a byproduct of the poor mental health and protecting herself. In conclusion, when it comes to world building, Marvel Studios has proven they know what they are doing. Even watching Disney Plus' special on the creation of WandaVision, it's easy to see that a lot of care is taken in crafting the story, developing the characters, old and new, and including small easter eggs for the more dedicated fanbase. There are links to other stories, both from previous films and hinted at for future Marvel properties, that keep the audience on their toes. Each Marvel property has a purpose in creating a bigger world for the characters and audience, giving them more to explore and look forward to. WandaVision doesn't always succeed in strong world building, as seen with the relatively weak characters of Agatha and Hayward, the latter of whom I wouldn't really be bothered if we never saw again, since he was so cliched as a villain. However, with other characters, there is a clear setup and payoff for their journeys that works, such as Darcy's PhD and Monica's new powers. Likewise, the audience is still witnessing the fallout from Infinity War and Endgame, which were the two biggest films of the MCU so far, which is great as it should be having such an enormous and lasting effect for a lot of people in the MCU, not just the main heroes. There's also the general world building that introduced chaos magic into the series and how this will tie Doctor Strange back into Wanda's story more directly. In recent weeks, it's come out that Doctor Strange was actually meant to appear in the finale of WandaVision in connection to the surreal advert shown during the series. However, this was deemed to be too distracting from Wanda's very personal story and cut. In my opinion, though, this could have made for quite an interesting lead in to the Doctor Strange sequel and also make a lot of sense that such a big event would attract the attention of another Avenger. It's not just the direct world building, such as characters introduced or storylines connected to the wider MCU, that makes WandaVision something fresh and exciting for Wanda and the MCU's audience. Marvel Studios uses the format in which WandaVision is filmed and the story it tells to explore Wanda's mental health and how the Hex is a huge representation of her deeply personal dreams and desires. The premise of WandaVision itself is a celebration of American television, and its meta and intro references to other sitcoms are very purposeful in demonstrating why and how Wanda chose this format upon which to base her new reality. But more on that in the next video.